Buffalo Comms 469 students. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on how to write rhetorical analysis arguments. First, we're going to look at our uh, assignment description section. Okay. This is from the analysis part of the assignment description. After your rhetorical situation ends, then you have a new heading called analysis. And I recommend that you look at the rhetoric handbook. We're going to go there in a second. Um, it should be structured in a series of deductive arguments. And deductive arguments means that they are um, claim, data, and analysis in that order. The opposite of deductive arguments would be inductive arguments. Inductive arguments are usually starting with data first, and then they end with the claim. Okay, so you, you provide a, whole, a lot of data first and then you kind of help a person to process it and then come to a conclusion. So we're not doing that and it's important to have the deductive order. First the claim, then the data, and then the analysis. Those are the training wheels that I would like you to learn because this uh, format of argumentation is the clearest for your future professional life as well as um, your academic arguments and papers. It's the norm and the standard. Uh, and so it does refer here in the instruction um, to the, the course handbook or the, the rhetoric handbook might have it, the argument section within that. It goes over what is a claim, what is data, and what is analysis. But I'm going to show that to you later in the video, in this video, through an example. So it's important to provide um, sufficient and vivid data from the artifact to support your arguments. And it's important if you're uh, talking about style. Style means from the sentence level downwards micro. Okay, So if you're analyzing verbal style, you have to quote because that's the only type of data that's relevant to showing word choice or sentence structure or metaphors, that kind of thing. So if you're also analyzing visuals, you may need to include a screenshot or an image within a figure. And in that case, I'll show, you know, you need to go to the, the APA handbook to know how to do the caption properly. Um, and while you're doing your analysis, we do want you to, or I do want you to integrate and cite very selected rhetorical theories and conceptual terms. Um, so you're going to be using the, hand, the uh, textbooks from the course, that only from the chapters that are assigned for this paper. So look up earlier in the instructions to find out how many concepts you need to cite. And um, remember that you, you should be using not the handbooks, uh, or not the textbooks glossary section. You should actually be using um, content from a chapter. So the only one that has a glossary, I believe, is Herrick. So don't don't use that, but actually cite from from a, a core chapter to to provide what unique idea um, Longker and Walker provide, or Herrick provides. Okay, so um, integrating the source citations into the paraphrases. Um, or, or paraphrases into the argument. That's an important skill I'm going to be looking for. And uh, citation ethics and clarity. Making sure that you are um, always giving a page number if you're quoting from a paginated source. Always giving a paragraph number if you're, pa if you're quoting from a, an online source that doesn't have page numbers. And that you um, distinguish your own idea from the source's idea. And that means that the source's idea needs to be actually represented in your writing, not just um, by a single word or very vague. So I'll be looking at how you cite. Um, and you can also cite from the rhetoric handbook by myself, Smith, okay? Or you can cite Silva Rhetorica. And the rhetoric handbook has in its preface instructions on how to cite and reference that handbook. So now I'm going to go to the rhetoric handbook. Um, this is the section on rhetorical analysis arguments. This is your logos. 
right? How you reason, how you structure your reasoning. And let's see here, claim data and analysis. So this is based on Toulmin's model of argument. You learned that as you uh, looked at chapter three in the Long Kern Walker textbook and how I have modified the, uh, the wording to suit the way I talk about uh, claim data and analysis is here. Okay, so I've got the, the model there from, from Toolman. So when I'm talking about claim, I'm talking about um, these ones here for this PowerPoint, claims in the body of the rhetorical analysis. So I'll give you an example here of what a claim might look like and uh, how it needs to appear as soon as possible in a paragraph. You could have a transitional phrase or sentence first if you want, but it needs to happen as soon as possible to present your claim. Okay, And it shouldn't be general and obvious, it could follow something that is general or obvious, but your um, claims should be something that yield uh, potential insight. Okay. A claim needs to include your own analytical ideas and it, it needs to include your sense of voice. So it's you who are standing very confidently saying I'm claiming this to be a positive thing about the artifact. So your um, secondary source can't be your claim. Um, you can't speak through their words. They're a different writer than you. And so um, your claim has to be your ideas about the artifact, not what someone else thinks or what a theory is. Um, it's not a counter argument against it. Okay, sometimes people are analyzing things that they disagree with. Um, the subject and verb are usually about how the artifact func functions rhetorically. So the sample I gave above said that the logos of the video's first argument rests on something. So it's basically saying this is how the author or the creator or the rhetor has created a strategy. And this is important too, I'm looking for evaluative terms. Um, in a claim, I want you to be able to say whether this is a good thing for its rhetoric or it's a bad thing. Is it something that's holding it back from achieving its purpose, its rhetorical aim? Or is it something that could be forwarding um, that purpose? And usually the claim includes a theory term. So something like logos or style or kairos. And so a, a lot of work goes into um, crafting a claim, and that's why you usually go through a deductive process, or sorry, inductive process first with your research, you end up finally with the conclusion after sorting through a bunch of data. So in your draft, you might find that your claims are actually your final sentences of paragraphs right now in a draft. If you identify your claim there, then you should move it to the top of your paragraph. Um, I talk about data, um, what kind of data is appropriate and sufficient. Okay, so when you're analyzing the artifacts, data or proof has to come from the artifact itself. Um, so when you're doing um, discussion of delivery, let's say you're analyzing a video or somebody's presentation, then um, you can't just rely on descriptive terms like fast or confident. You need to actually um, provide some objective behavioral data. So usually um, this kind of thing is objective data. This here is an interpretation and it, it's from you as the, the observer. It's not data, it's more of a claim. Okay. So here you dramatize the situation for us by rolling your eyes and imitating him with a high-pitched voice. So this here is vivid description and it constitutes data. Okay. So I've talked about 
if you're discussing style, you need to quote. If you discuss um, the structure of content, sometimes you might need to say, first an audience sees this, then an audience sees that. So using first and then, and then thirdly, those kinds of organizational structures. Um, when you're doing visuals, I have already talked about that. Navigation of websites is in there. And ultimately, you're not supposed to overwhelm the reader with unnecessarily long or complex data or examples. They need to be very well selected. They need to be sufficient. They need to be vivid enough to get a person who's reading your analysis to feel like they've got a tangible hold of um, something from the artifact without having to go to the artifact itself. Um, you're bringing part of the artifact into your paragraph so that it's convenient right there for them to, to experience. And the third step after you provide data is what I call the analysis. And it shows how the data that you've provided supports your initial claim. So it unpacks the data. It points out features of the data that you've provided. Your role is like a tour guide. And so oftentimes you, you point out or you pull out words or phrases from a quotation. You echo yourself so that your, um, your quote uh, or your description now has some interpretation involved in it. Okay, so that's what I've just talked about and making sure that your paragraph ends with your insight and your thoughts and don't end with a secondary sources idea because you can't talk through them. They're another person, another writer. You can use them, but don't end your paragraph with them. Okay, so I've talked about um, the way it's structured, why the claim needs to be first, um, why you should not have data first, why the analysis follows the data. So that's the help helping you understand the logic of the structure that I'm asking for. And this section tells you how to put your secondary sources in, how do you integrate them, and uh, there's a place you can put it right after a claim in order to explain one of your key terms further. Remember in this um, analysis who your audience is. It's not a person who knows nothing about rhetoric. So you don't need to go over the basics of what the terms mean to everyone. But you should um, talk about a specific idea from Long Kern Walker or a specific concept from Herrick and show that you have uh, more deep knowledge and that you're citing a particular author's point of view on that topic or that theory. You can also provide it after the data during analysis as long as your voice is really beside the source that you are um, citing, right? You can't ventriloquize through them or speak through them. They are next to you. So how do you bring it in? These points will tell you how you can um, cite someone and integrate their idea into your argument through the analysis phase. Okay, and why not to begin your paragraphs with citations in general. Okay, and what do you do if you have to actually explain some of the ideas in a quote? Um, introducing your sources really well is part of that as well. So I give an example of how a source is integrated, or at least introduced, and context is provided before the quote even begins. So these are important skills, um, how to integrate that into the argument surrounding that sentence that you quote in or cite in, how to keep them secondary, making sure that they don't take over your argument, and if you want to use uh, the key terms, when do you use italics and when not to. And that's the end of that section. Those are important um, instructions. I wanted to go over what was in them. Now just to cap off my video, I want to go to a sample. And the sample is found in uh, the MA thesis by Ashley Jett. And I have posted the link to her thesis, which is online, publicly available at the University of Calgary Library. It's a master's thesis, and so its argument is much longer, and its analysis is much longer than yours needs to be. But I wanted to just bring up the, um, 
the source and show you some of the ways that she, she argues in a paragraph. So she's analyzing um, speeches by Mitt Romney and Ann Romney and Barack Obama and Michelle Obama during the 2012 uh, national conventions during the election of that year. And this section has two headings. Please don't stack your headings like that. But um, you can have uh, one heading for your, for your analysis if you need a heading. Otherwise, you don't need to even bother because your essay is so short. So here, we're going to assume that um, this is a claim in his speech. He overtly praised. OK, so here's an obvious fact. It's descriptive. Um, when I was talking about claims, you can precede them with something that's obvious and then bring in your own claim. So she has begun a very long argument with a paragraph that only includes a claim. You don't need to do that because your argument is not as long as hers. But this is um, this just provides uh, her overall claim about the from the section of on Mitt Romney. So she's saying um, that Mitt Romney's claims it's likely that they were made with great clarity in attempts to combat the uh, accusation that the Republican Party was waging a war on women. And you can see that um, she refers back to her rhetorical situation section so that she doesn't have to digress at this point to explain the context of the accusation that the Republican Party was waging a war on women. And so um, you wouldn't say, oh, it's discussed in that section. You can just say um, discussed above, right? Because yours doesn't have chapter headings. It's not a long paper. And you could just say discussed above. That would be fine as a cross-reference. Here it shows that there is a um, evaluation by the, the writer of the analysis. So Ashley is saying that his claims were clear and she's uh, talking about clarity. Clarity is a key term within the canon of style. And so now um, she has a little bit of a, a background section about the audience. So I'm going to skip over that because that's something that she does in a much larger argument. So now um, this is more of a specific claim. He used his parents' marriage as an example of gender equality. Now he gives specific uh, data from the actual artifact. And it even uh, sequences it, saying that then he attempts to do this. So we've got two examples consecutive. And notice that he pulls out the word beautiful from this quotation. So this analysis um, analy analyzes aspects from the quotations just given. It echoes particular words and it provides more of an interpretation by Ashley Jett who's writing this analysis. Okay, so here also um, is the next claim also praised his wife Anne Romney and it's presumed here that there's clarity is being outlined, right? Because clear claim were, was the earlier thing. So um, the praise uh, is being um, is being next discussed. We have a longer quote because it's uh, more than 40 words long. It's set off as a block quotation. And after you have such a long quotation, it's important to pull out some keywords. So here, this word um, heroic. Okay, it's right up here. Okay. So you can see how um, quotations are being introduced from the artifact itself. And uh, we've got key terms from a theorist being brought in here. Kenneth Burke is the theorist, and this is an example of her integrating a specific theory, rhetorical theory idea within her argument. So she's introducing um, how Mitt Romney is using a terministic screen 
And in this paper, because it's a long thesis, she has already cited Kenneth Berg within her thesis. And so at this point, she's doing a cross-reference. What you would need to do is include the, uh, the year of his text that you got the words terministic screen from, right? But because her thesis has already cited Kenneth Burke, has already given a specific page number for the word terministic screen. Um, so in this case, she's excused from mentioning it again because the reader has already received a very specific citation with year, author year and, and page number. Okay, so just remember, don't uh, you know you're going to have to include author year and page number when you do this, but she's doing a cross reference. Okay, but she is integrating that concept and showing that she's using it now within uh, her analysis. So you can see more of her analysis if you like. I'm not going to go into much more, but um, you can see that data claims and the analysis part of the argument are used perhaps not always in that order because I want you to use that order but she's more an advanced writer and she can vary um, the structure she also needs to vary her structure somewhat because she's writing quite a long analysis so that's giving you some ideas of advanced analysis and how how they're discussed and analyzed in an intelligent way with uh, sentences like these. So I wish you well on your analysis of your artifact. Talk to you later.